courtroom demeanor and etiquette. I run a courtroom. How about who wants to get in the jury box? I need you guys standing up and moving around. You're all, I see half of you yawning, which I understand. Get, get in the jury box. Come on. All right, now I need some uh, lawyers. I need, I need a defense team and I need a prosecution team. I need three people to, all right, I'm volunteering you three, right, you young ladies right there, right in that row. Just stand up where you are. Now you're going to be a prosecution team or the plaintiff's team. Which table do you go to? Why? You're close. The prosecution or the plaintiff have, having the burden of proof sits closer to the trier of fact, to the jury. You are correct. So let's, let's move you up here. Now I need a defense team. All right, the next three students. Come on up. Grab chairs, line up. Let's just pull those three chairs down. Now, why did I, why did I have three of you come up here? Anybody? Go. Go. Absolutely right. So you're going to have, this is what you're going to look like on February 14th, 2015 uh, in the R R Regional Justice Center when you come down to try your case. Now, there will be a difference, and one of the coaches brought this up. You need to get yourself a hard copy of card paper, and you're going to have your name printed here, your real live name. So if you are Susie Smith, you're going to have your name on here, and you're going to fold it. Table 10. Take a tent, and you're going to put it in front of you so that everybody's name is going to be on the table in front of them so that when your judges are talking to you, they can say, Ms. Smith, Ms. Jones, whoever you are, they know who you are. And that's important for your scoring so that when they give you a score, you get your score and not a score for somebody else who didn't do it well. All right. Uh, First stage, first step in the process, you're going to introduce yourself. Now, before we even get there, let's talk about what everything is and how everything's identified. Where's the bar? Is there, a, first of all, you've heard about the bar, everybody, the lawyers are admitted to the bar. Where's the bar in a courtroom? Is there a bar in the courtroom? Anybody? Where's the bar? Right there. This piece of wood extended across the back of council table is called the bar. And what is the bar? Why, why is there a distinction? Anybody raise your hand. Go. Exactly. And that's the public section. People, we, are, we, are in an, we live in an open society, an open and public courtroom. So when a courtroom's in session, those doors are unlocked. We don't have star chambers in the United States. Um, so those doors are open. When courtrooms and courts in session, the people can come and go. But they are separated from the effort, the, the focus of the court by the bar. Who can, who can appear in front of the bar and work in the, in the court? Lawyers. That was probably too. You have to be admitted to the bar in order to pass through the bar to practice. Why is it important to be a lawyer? Uh, why do I need, as a presiding judge, people who are skilled and trained in the law? Because the, the answer to the question is because the law is very complex. There are a lot of rules, intricacies to it, protocols that must be followed in order to maintain the decorum of the court. I can't have a kangaroo court. I can't have people jumping up and down, thinking up different rules or applying different rules because then we'd have anarchy. Um, and we are a court of law. So you spend four years undergrad and three years in law school, hopefully, learning the law. You demonstrate that knowledge, that basic knowledge of the law by passing the bar. Not passing the bar there, passing the written three days of hell that is the bar exam. Okay. <laughs> So that's, why, that get, that's what gives these lawyers the responsibility and the uh, opportunity to present their case or be, work before the bar. All right, within the courtroom, there are areas, obviously self-identified. This is a presiding judge. Presiding judge, the bench sits uh, up from the floor of the bar because we're supposed to be smarter and better looking and 
elected. We are, frankly, that's the only distinction. We've convinced a half a million people to vote for us. So that's why we get the opportunity to be here. You, the jury, obviously self-evident. You are the trier of fact. You make the decisions uh, based upon the facts as you understand them. The facts come from where? The witness stand. So uh, when a case, remember, a, a jury trial, a trial, the, the purpose of a trial is to settle a controversy. You have two sides. You have one side that says, these are the facts, and you have the other side that says, no, they're wrong, we're right, these are the facts. So we are all here to settle a controversy. A judge's responsibility is in a jury trial is not to rule on the facts. A judge's responsibility in a jury trial is to preside over the effort to make the effort fair. A judge's oath, my oath, is to be neutral. So I might have a view of the evidence. I might have a certain bias or prejudice one way or the other. I'm a human being. But I, I have pledged and taken an oath to put that aside if I have one. And to rule on the evidence as the evidence is presented by the sides. It's the lawyer's responsibility to present their case, and they present their case to the witnesses. They present their case to the jury. The jury is composed of citizens who are supposed to be disinterested and neutral as well to come to a fair decision to settle the controversy between the sides. Your controversy in this action is a breach of contract and a defamation action. So you're going to have elements to breach of contract and defamation. It's their responsibility to prove uh, by a preponderance of the evidence that that's incur occurred, and they say, no, it hasn't, and they're going to try to convince you that they haven't met that burden, that the elements have not been met. Any, any question about that? Now, in a real life, they would be asking for the jury to, do, to give them money or put somebody in find somebody guilty if it was a criminal case and put them and ask the judge to put them in jail. If it's a murder case in this state, a jury gets to decide whether somebody goes to prison um, or is, if they're found guilty for how long. But that's not the role that you're going to play in this case. You're going to be just talking about money. And ultimately, again, you're not going to be asking for money damages. You're just going to be asking for a verdict based upon evidence. And I'm completely off script. Am I doing okay? Okay. All right. Mrs. McAllister? Yeah. Okay. I want everybody to do, and this is true for your experienced mock trial people as well as your new folks, is to remember to review the rules. There are rules. Okay? And there are rules specifically for this competition, as every competition should have. Those rules are posted on the website, the NV Bar website. And you should be looking at those at the beginning of the year and then review them again when we get closer to competition. So, newbie or not, remember, just want to hit those key rules again. Communication between team members. Communication at the council tables is totally permitted. This year, defendant and plaintiff will sit at the council tables. So that puts four people at each council table and a communication between them is acceptable. The other witnesses who sit behind the bar are not to be communicated with. The only time they can be is when they are in the witness stand and they're being questioned. That is the only time they're communicated with. Okay? If you are the two witnesses behind the bar, don't talk to each other. Don't talk to the council. Don't talk to each other. Just shut up, pay attention, and participate. Don't talk to each other because that isn't technically against the rules, but it could be construed as that. Don't do it. You should be prepared when you come into that courtroom to do what you need to do. Don't talk to each other. Uh, communication between team and coaches, once again, not allowed. I don't want, coaches should not be raising an eyebrow. They should not be, oh, I'm going to do this when it's time to move on to something else. No communication across the bar between team and coaches. Like we said, if there's some sort of dispute as to how the rules are being followed, only the students can deal with that. Teachers do not get to deal with that. Now, if there's a dispute in the courtroom, and a teacher's in the courtroom, which teachers should always be in the courtroom with their teams? There's a, there's a dispute, something's going on, you want a committee member to be in there to see what's going on, you think something's going really wrong, come on into the tab room, let us know that there's a dispute, there's something that you need a higher authority for. 
that's totally cool. We appreciate being notified of that. Okay, but your students shouldn't be telling you that. You should be there finding out, oh, my students need backup. I'm going to get them backup. That's okay. Um, once again, timekeepers, raise your cards. That's what you're allowed to do. Don't do anything else. Okay, um, don't count on your coach to know these rules. You need to know these rules. Rule number three, the witness is bound by their statement. They cannot say things about this case that are not in their statement. Okay? They can't make stuff up that isn't actually what they said in their statement. Now, they may get a question, and they may be asking, okay, well, what color shirt were you wearing that day? Well, guess what? That doesn't matter, so you can say, I was wearing a green shirt that day, as long as it isn't something that affects the case. Okay? You can, you can create a character. You can add a backstory in your own imagination about how you came to that day. But it has to be something that is neutral, that does not make your case stronger or weaker. It, and that goes to rule number four, unfair extrapolation. If you say, oh, I was wearing a green shirt that day, and somebody else testifies to saying, oh, I saw somebody in a green shirt that day, okay, now you've crossed the boundary. You've put something into your statement about that green shirt that was never there. Then you are unfairly dealing, putting something into this case that wasn't there. So you are bound to stay by what your statement is. And if you said in your statement, I hit the duck with my hammer. You can't get up on the stand and say, I didn't hit any ducks. I don't know what you're talking about. That never happened. Okay, first of all, hopefully you're going to get impeached. But second of all, that's just not ethical. You're bound by that statement. That's your statement. Okay? Um, team composition we talked about earlier. Remember, six to eight people. No more, no less. That's why you want to have eight when you go to regionals, just in case you go to state, you've got some people to spare. Because when you go to state, I mean, when you go to regionals and you have those eight people and two of them are alternates, if you lose any of the people, you can totally reassign the roles between regionals and state. So if you were an attorney for regionals and one of your witnesses drops out and suddenly you become a witness for state, that's totally cool, as long as it's the same human beings. That's the key element. Um, here's one. that I have not seen happen since my very first year in competition, but you never know. Make sure that in that jury box, when you go into a trial, you have at least three judges. You have to have at least three judges, scoring judges. Okay? You should have, the, the person up here who's presiding is not writing a ballot about you. They're busy. They're deciding about objections and making sure everybody's following the rules and making sure all the things are proceeding properly. The people in the box are right in the ballots and there should be at least three of them in there. We're, we're trying to be really careful, but stuff happens. So please make sure of that. If there's not, stand up and say, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I don't think that we have the right number of judges in the jury box. Could we check on that, please? Be very respectful. Yes, dear. There is allowed to be an even number of judges. You just want to make sure that there's at least three. Okay? Because that way there's, there can be no ties. Okay? And sometimes there'll be an extra judge and they'll, they'll pitch one of the ballots if there's a tie. You know, they'll just say, okay, this fourth person actually technically wasn't supposed to be there. So they wrote a ballot, but we're not even going to look at it. And we're going to look at the people who were assigned to be there. And that can just be a weird thing. That doesn't usually happen either, but just make sure that there's at least three. Because one time we had two people in the jury, and then the presiding tried to write a ballot, and that's, it didn't go well. So try not to do that. Yes? On the same note, but if it's, um, winning is based off of, like, whether they say win or loss, right? Not the yes. Point. so uh, points come in later, but I, the first level is win-loss, yes. Right. So if there's a tie, why not just count up those points and then get rid of it instead of the No, there's no ties. Uh, we're saying ties of ballots. That's why you want an odd number of judging, because 
you can't, that way there can be no two and two. It's only an odd number of judges that we count because otherwise you can have a tie and we don't want any ties. There are no ties, never ties, bad things. Um, dispute resolution, okay, somebody, the defense team says prosecution was conferring with their coaches during the trial. That's a dispute. You're saying that this trial is now in dispute. That is after the trial has occurred. That is something that only the student attorneys deal with. Coaches are not involved, and they negotiate. They, they speak their piece. They say it to the judge. The judge decides right then and there. Here's the dispute. I've decided that this happened. This didn't happen. Boom. But you can't get your coaches involved. That's just up to the students. Okay? Familiarize yourself with that. Okay, courtroom respect. Always stand when you speak, even if you are simply saying yes or no. Get up off your butt. That's just a sign of respect. Do not ever speak to a judge when you're seated in a chair. I don't care what it is, okay? Um, no smirking, eye rolling, and giggling. Uh, even if you're laughing at your own teammate, it's just a sign of disrespect. It's saying, I, I think you're a jerk. And you can be seen. Your people can totally see you. There's a whole bunch of people watching you. So you can't just get away with it. No, <sighs> none of that. You, you rein it in. You got to do it. It's very, very essential that you don't do that. And I think it's even worse if you do it towards your own teammate. But if somebody stands up and objects from another team, and, what, and it's not, maybe you're not the attorney that's dealing with that particular objection, it's one of your co-counsel, you still don't get to sit there and go, oh, what a stupid objection, oh my gosh. Don't do that. Now you guys, do you understand Certain attorneys deal with certain other attorneys. If it's your witness on the stand, say you were over, you're, uh, you're the middle attorney over there, and it was your witness on the stand. And now, middle attorney over here is the cross-examiner of this witness. Only that attorney can object. You have your exact person that you can object and talk about. Nobody else, you can help each other. You can say, hey, get up and object. You can support each other at the table, but you, nobody else is allowed to do that. Okay? So make sure that that gets very clear because that can also be a rules violation. So if you figure out, oh my gosh, I'm a, you know, I've got that, that other attorney is now talking who's, it's not their witness. That is definitely something that you want to bring up at the end of trial, that's the wrong attorney. You could bring it up right then and say, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I thought it was that person's witness because you want to be fair, okay? And now the real kicker, the only reason we're ever doing this so that we have really cool new things to wear, all right? So, ladies, we're gonna start with you. No cleavage, even a hint. Because guess what? Sometimes you have to bend over to pick up a paper or something like that. Nothing should show ever. Okay? If you have to be constantly adjusting, if your jacket's too tight or something like that, you are wearing the wrong clothes. You should be able to go into that courtroom, be confident in what you're wearing, and never have to even adjust anything. Okay? If you constantly have to tug things down to keep things covered, no, 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 no. Okay, if your thigh is showing, that's wrong. I know. They're so, oh my gosh, you mean I have to wear my mom's clothes? Yes, you do, okay? Because I understand you are at the time in your life when you look good in those skirts, and you do. But the courtroom is not the place to wear them. So cover it up. Um, no hooker heels. You know what I'm talking about. This is Vegas. And you should, if you're going to, flats are great, heels are great. Whatever shoes you wear, you need to practice in those shoes. And I don't mean just that morning. I mean probably the whole month 
up to there. I mean, practice walking around in them, practice doing your questioning. I've had so many female students who tell me, these are my power shoes. When I put these on, I feel powerful. Yes! Those are the shoes you want. Okay? And those are the shoes that will give you confidence. But you need to practice in them. You need to be so comfortable in them, and you can wear them all day, and they're great. Okay? But that's what you have to do. You have to own them. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, but it's navy and long sleeve. No, that's sexy. Look, she's got a little shoulders peeking out. That's not why we're here. Okay? Because, frankly, who are you looking sexy for? The judges? Ew. No. That's not nice. So, mmm. Uh, here's another no, no. Yeah, it's black. Once again, that's cleavage. Uh, don't know what hooker heels are? That would be these. Don't wear those. Um, oh, look, there was even a whole slideshow on the news about really inappropriate shoes. So we have acceptable and unacceptable. Okay? Hopefully that's clear. Uh, gentlemen, preferably a suit, but that is not a requirement. Okay, suits cost money, they're expensive, I understand that. Okay, shirt and tie for sure. Dress shirt, please, no polo shirts. Oh, God, it just makes me sad. No sneakers, and I don't care if they're black. No dress shoes. You can get them at Payless really inexpensively. Savers is awesome, okay? Savers has great shoes, low price, okay? Never, ever, ever white socks. Mm -mm. Um, no low socks. So even if they're black, if I see your ankle bone, they're wrong. Okay, they need to at least go halfway up your leg, halfway up your calf. Um, tuck in your shirt, pull up your pants, wear a belt. I'm not kidding. Okay, even if you have to borrow one, guys, wear a belt. Um, if you look like someone's dad, you're doing it right. <laughs> that is just the best thing there. Uh, no no's part two. Let's see here. There it is. There it is. Not only a white sock, but a low sock. No, no. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. Polos? No. No. The lady there's fine. Uh, yeah, they look cash. Don't know. This is not Sweaterville. Although, <laughs> technically, as a witness, you could get away with that. But And then, what the pants thing? Come on. I just threw that in there to amuse you because I know none of you would ever dream of doing a thing like that. All right. The rule is dress for, su dress for success and you will be successful. Or maybe not. And I'm done two minutes early. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes. One, um, Ms. McAllister was talking earlier about um, no, no, uh, no eye rolling or OR, you know, uh, engaging in conduct that looks bad. As a um, scoring judge, I will also look at what the council is doing at the council table. So what that means to me is if you are one of the that is not up, that you're one of the two attorneys who's not examining the witness or cross-examining the witness, I'm looking at what you're doing at counsel table. So don't, please, don't do this. Don't, like, slump over. Um, you, know, you know, don't look bored. Do something. Um, maybe, like, like, pretend to be writing something or actually be writing something. But, like, like sit up straight. Uh, I mean, because you're being watched. So even if you're not, quote, unquote, on, you still have to make sure to do that. Um, second, um, what we did talk about a bit was, um, we talked a little bit about what the well is, um, because uh, I'll just say, and Ms. McAllister will tell you in a second, um, it's different down here versus up there. Um, so if you want to, if you could just We talk addressed that this morning. You did, okay. Yeah. Um, and I would like to add to what Mr. Craner said, when you enter the courthouse, not the courtroom, the courthouse, when you get to RJC on competition day, you're on when you get there. 
we're all on the same floor, you don't know which one of these people that you slam into with your Starbucks is going to be your scoring judge. Okay? When you're in the bathroom and you're going, well, F that judge, they don't know what's going on. Guess who's in the next stall? Okay? When you get in the car to go home after a competition, let it go, baby. Let it rip. But the whole time you're in that building, remember, you are potentially being watched by somebody who's going to score you the whole day. When you're having lunch, when you're in the hallway, when you're conferring with your friends, whatever you're doing that entire day. When you leave your water bottle in the courthouse, when you leave it in the courtroom, the judge sees that, that you just, well, oh, someone will pick up after me because I'm special and I'm the world. You're not. And they notice that attitude. And not only does that affect your score, but that affects our whole competition. These people who come to volunteer that day, we can't do it without them. And if they feel like these students don't give a rip, they're disrespectful, they don't care about the process, they don't care about this or themselves or the world, they don't want to come out on their Saturday and do this for you. Be on your very, very best behavior. I know that you have the capability of doing it. Because what goes on during the trial, for the most part, is fantastic. It's amazing. It's, an, it's just astounding the level of behavior and comportment that you, you can display during that time. Just spread it all the way out from when you get there to when you leave. And make your, be proud of yourself because you deserve it. And show everybody the respect that you have earned by all the hard work that you're doing. Okay? That's essential. If that happens, anything other problems we have are nothing. We can fix them. It's not a problem. That's the big thing. Okay? And last, my last word, enjoy yourself. This is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a really great experience. If it's not fun for you, you're doing something wrong. It should be fun, and it is fun. Questions, comments, concerns? Yes? One point. You're in the courtroom. Your comments need to be addressed to the court. You're making objections. You're talking to the judge. At no point should you ever turn to opposing counsel and say, no, it's not. It's irrelevant. Don't talk to them. You need to conduct yourselves over here like they're not even in the room. They're a gnat. They're a problem. If they're doing something wrong, you're telling the judge about it, and the judge is going to pull on it. Don't engage with opposing counsel. The other thing you all need to remember, particularly when you're sitting at the bench, things like you all can see everything you're doing in a way you don't see when you're sitting behind it. So your foot shaking like crazy, don't do that in the corner. My foot over here shaking like crazy, don't do that in the corner. You need to be conscious of the fact that everything you do, they see, and they score you on it. The jury in the court yeah. isn't a jury making a decision. They're a jury signing points. And so they're going to see everything you do. When you've got a really good witness, and they get on the stand, and they do their thing, and they're absolutely freaking hysterical, you may not laugh. Because the judges are going to see that, and they're going to score you down for it. They expect you to be flat and boring. Do it. And just be conscious of that, guys. See everything down. Pens. Not touch your pens unless you have something to write and then put it down. Clicking pens. People stand up desk brushes with a pen. I love the pen. I like, you know, it's a crutch. Don't carry your pens. Be conscious of those kind of things. So your pockets shut. I wish I were kidding. We're not kidding. We did that for a student. Put the key of her hands out of her pocket. So I'm shut. Just be conscious of it. And you may want to, I love you know technology now. With your iPhones, you may want to have somebody else video you, examining your witnesses. Just turn your phone on and video it. And then you get to see what you look like, what your posture's like, how you look in your outfit, how other people see you. You are going to be on your feet 
from 7 a.m. until 6 or 7 o'clock that night. You're going to be walking around on hard tile floors all over that building. Your feet are going to hurt. Your suit's going to get wrinkled. You need to stand up and look like your feet don't hurt when your suit's not wrinkled. So have some video of you. So you get an idea what you look like. And you can kind of see how other people are seeing you. It'll make a huge difference in what you do. Anything okay. Else? Another, another thing, um, the bite I was forgetting it. Oh, yes, yes. Um, Ms. McAllister, um, and I know others have said about no communications, um, you know, between, between the parties, that also applies if we take a break during the trial, um, just to be very clear about that. We've had a couple of times when, for whatever reason, we had to take a recess during the trial. Um, the, the attorneys, um, Attorneys can still confer about, about things, but they cannot talk to the witnesses. We've had this happen a couple of times, and so we want to, want to um, um, make sure that that, that that type of thing does not happen. And also, Ms. Barker brought up, brought, brought up a point. Didn't we say no video? Here's oh, no, she means preparing. Okay, okay. Yeah, exactly. Preparation, yeah. Okay, just want to make sure people know that, that uh, you, cannot, you cannot video and that you cannot use your cell phone or, or a computer. Uh, during the trial, you can go through your notes. Right. Okay. Talk about no personal encounters. Good. Okay. But Kathleen. there was an incident this last year where somebody in the audience, uh, the judge had called a recess for a few minutes, and someone in the audience was talking too loud about their team and the other team. And so please caution your family members, anybody who comes to watch the uh, mock trial, to be very circumspect during the entire day, especially during the trial. Go to the bathroom before you start. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. don't try to go to the bathroom in the Add your time. phones to your coach. You can separate yourselves and then you're not even tempted to touch it. Give them to your coach and your coach will roll the ball. Go to the bathroom first. But right. You, but if you get sick, you get no, sick. You get sick. You know, if you're sitting at council table or you're, well, if you're a witness, it's less important because you're behind the bar. But if you're at council table and you literally think, I'm going to throw up, stand up and say, excuse me, Your Honor, I'm feeling sick, I have to leave, and go. Don't let somebody stop you and say, oh, no, that'll ruin the trial. It will when you barf, okay? Go to the bathroom. Don't get sick in my courtroom. It's best if you don't. But if you do, go out, definitely. Anything else? That is entirely up to the judge. They should ask at the beginning of the trial and get that judge's decision on how they should do that. Southern protocol is more uh, is more loose than northern. If you go north for competition and you're in federal court, they want you working from the podium. We've run across that. But in, in the eight down here, our community, our legal community, is a little more work the well, work the do your trial. We have lunch. Lunch! You made it! Yay!